Honestly, it's the hallway track. Like the biggest, the spaces where I've learned the most at CPPCon have been in the evenings, hanging out with people over a drink or at dinner and just chatting. Today, I will be talking about, uh, so there's the, the obligatory uh, C++ formatted slide. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a Cambrian explosion for C++ software development tools. My name is Emery Berger. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, and my group has built a bunch of widely used uh, open source tools. And we'll talk about some today. So before I get into it, I want to uh, first talk about this thing that happened. Uh, it's this Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, sometimes called the KPG event. Um, I, I trust many of you have heard of it. Uh, it's this uh, big asteroid that crashed down off of the Yucatan Peninsula uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it wasn't really great news for the dinosaurs. Uh, it kind of wiped them out. Uh, and I think we're actually facing a similar extinction event. Uh, and the extinction event is caused by the asteroids represented by OpenAI. Um, so what's happening is uh, it's obviously having huge ramifications. Um, in, you know, the particular interest to me is that it's wiped out whole areas of programming languages and software engineering research, uh, really cutting edge stuff that is now uh, eclipsed uh, or crushed, I guess, is maybe the better way of saying it. Um, so this includes uh, things that people have been working on for decades, like automatic test generation, uh, program comprehension, uh, and a thing that, uh, that you may not know about called program synthesis. Uh, this is the thing that's embedded in Excel. Some of you may have used this thing called Flashville. That's a program synthesis tool. People have been working on it pretty extensively. Uh, this is a paper that just appeared last year at a major PL conference. Um, and I, I crossed out the title uh, because I don't want to, you know, uh, I'm not picking on anybody in particular. I literally just picked a random paper from the conference. Actually, I really like the authors. I think they're great. Um, but uh, here is a thing, and I know this is a C++ conference, but it was about Java. Uh, it basically was a system that could take old style Java programs that are written in a kind of classic API of invoking functions and change them to use a fluent API or a streaming API. All right? And so I had a lot of technology. Uh, it also included some AI, but a bunch of, of uh, complicated uh, analysis and so on. Um, and, and it worked really well. Uh, and um, here's another thing that works really well. Uh, so that's me and my account. And it may be hard to see, but it says convert this Java program to use streams. Uh, and this is in ChatGPT. Uh, and indeed, it produces uh, almost exactly the identical result. Uh, so this is the result from the paper. This is the result from ChatGPT. It is slightly different, but really trivially so. Uh, and so this is kind of an asteroid, right, crushing this research. So. That seems like bad news, um, and it was bad news for the dinosaurs. Um, but it was good news for little weird characters who somehow scurried around under the feet of the dinosaurs, right, uh, and, and managed to, uh, to eke out an ecological niche. And so I'm going to be talking about this little character. Uh, and um, uh, I, I kind of like to think of myself as this little character. Um, <laughs> but albeit with more hair, I guess. Um, so anyway, so um, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, some, some work that we've done in another context and then bring it back to C++. So um, our group has produced this widely used uh, profiler uh, for Python called Scalene. Uh, we just presented it uh, at this conference at, uh, called OSDI in Boston, uh, where it won a Best Paper Award, which was very nice. Uh, it's been downloaded uh, more than 800,000 times, so it's pretty popular. Uh, it's a cool profiler. Uh, it does lots of interesting stuff. I'll just show you very quickly. Uh, this is output from Scalene. Um, it shows you at a high level what's going on in your program in terms of time and memory and memory consumption over time. Uh, it breaks things down into where your time has gone. Uh, and you can see, like, here's how much memory is being consumed on a line by line or function by function basis. Uh, and it also now works inside Visual Studio. OK, great. So uh, probably everybody here agrees that writing your code in Python maybe not your best move for performance reasons, right? Uh, we would argue that profiling it with Scalene will help you get better performance. But imagine if instead you could just get your profiler to optimize your code, right? So that's really the dream, I think. Uh, and in fact, this is what we've now brought to Scalene. 
So you can click on this little button in the user interface called advanced options and it'll open up this pane uh, and you have to enter in, this is the one thing you have to do, you have to bring your own open AI key. Uh, and this is going to be true for all of the, the stuff I'm going to talk about today in this talk. Uh, everything looks like this. You need to be co connected to some open AI account. Uh, you need to give it a buck, I think, or 50 cents uh, to get started. Uh, I'll talk about cost later, like really soon. Anyway, once you do that, uh, it exposes in the user interface these uh, little lightning bolts and, um, and explosions. And if you click on an explosion, it suggests an optimization for an entire region of code. So here it suggested an optimization. It tells you why it proposed this optimization. Um, and it takes the performance of the original, uh, dramatically improves it, uh, cuts the time by, to basically a third or less, and uh, drastically reduces the memory consumption. Okay? Uh, the results can be pretty impressive. Uh, so this is a report of a 90x speed up uh, that was automatically generated. Uh, so it's got some original code, it's got the scaling proposed code, uh, which takes advantage of a native library. Uh, so um, you know, all if you want high performance in Python, you really need to be using C++, the actual fact. Uh, and so it's sort of like Fight Club, like first rule of high performance Python programming is don't talk about Python. Um, so anyway, uh, so that's scaling, and now scaling has AI-based uh, uh, powered optimizations. Of course, it's for Python, uh, not for C++. Uh, we are planning to bring this to our other profiler called Cause, uh, that some of you may know about. Uh, I found to my surprise and delight uh, uh, that, oh, that's nice. Um, okay, well, I can't see my screen anymore, but that's okay. Um, so I found to my surprise and delight that's become very popular in the Rust uh, world. Uh, I know I just said that word. Uh, which probably be bleeped out of the slides. Um, but anyway, uh, it's been downloaded over 400,000 times, which is cool. It's a great profiler. Uh, we plan to bring the same AI-powered optimizations to cause uh, that we have for scaling. So what's going on here? So uh, what we did is we evolved a tool. So we took a profiler. Normally, profilers just tell you, hey, I think this is where your code is spending its time. And we've moved the needle. We've said, look, don't just tell us where things are. Tell us what to do. Right? So I argue this closes the loop between the tool and the human's goal. Nobody ever really wanted to run a profiler, I think. Right? You really wanted your code to just be fast or to consume less memory, right? to be more efficient. The profiler was because we didn't know how to get the rest of the way. Right? We relied on the programmer, and it turns out we can actually now leverage these AI systems. Right? So this is the old world. Right? Here's where your code may be uh, slow, and maybe you can figure it out. And here's the new world, right? I figured it out for you. Go get some beer, all right? So we're gonna exploit this niche. This is the next thing we do. We're evolving, right? So profilers have a lot of knowledge. So it's not just the source code they have, right? They know where the code is inefficient, and they even know why the code is inefficient, right? So you can imagine all kinds of things that you can use in a profiler in terms of gathering data, like performance counters, for example, to say, oh, this is the exact kind of performance problem I have. So it can perform this diagnosis. So in Python land, you can say, oh, I'm spending a lot of time in the Python interpreter, which is slow, that's bad, right? So we want to use native libraries, right? If you're having low core utilization, which is a problem uh, in, in Python, period, but if you're using native libraries and you have low core utilization, uh, maybe you need to use vectorization, right? And do something else like multiple threads or multiple processes. No usage of the GPU or poor utilization, you need to improve the utilization of the GPU, uh, find GPU optimized libraries, et cetera. So there's a whole litany of things that we can do. And the profiler, of course, has the original code, which is a huge advantage. Uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. All right? So um, the next step I want to talk about is ensuring fitness. So there was Evolve, uh, there was exploiting a niche, and now we're going to ensure fitness. This is how you survive. Right? So here, we want to make sure that the AI is actually not kind of going off the rails. So the beauty of doing this in the context of a, a profiler is we have the original code. We just need to make sure that the optimized code that's suggested does the same thing. All right? So what we can do is we can actually go back to the AI and ask it for tests. And then we can run the tests. And we can see that the two things actually are equal. And this becomes part of a loop. Uh, you also, of course, want to verify that the optimization that's suggested really did improve performance or reduce memory consumption or something. And this can all be part of a validation loop. All right, so at a high level, what are we doing? We're closing the loop between a tool and the actual goal of a developer. We're exploiting the niche, 
using whatever information we have at our disposal, be it static or dynamic, and then we're ensuring fitness to try to make sure that what happened from the AI's point of view actually is something that is what we wanted. All right, so I've talked about doing this in the context of profilers. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about doing this in the context of two other tools. Uh, one is a debugger and the other is a compiler. All right, so the first one we call ChatDBG. Uh, so uh, ChatDBG is a debugger for C++ or C or Python or Rust. Uh, that integrates with your existing debugger. So it's kind of like a plug-in for LLDB or GDB or PDB, the Python debugger. Um, and it's, instead of just being part of the debugger, it actually goes and diagnoses the problem, or tries to, and suggests fixes. So I'm gonna walk you through an example. Um, so here is some code. Uh, I'm, the code crashes. Uh, we launch GDB, and you can see that it says GDB dash chat DBG that shows you that the extension has been installed. Uh, and then if you run the program, this particular program is a, just a test. Uh, it triggers a failed assertion, all right, and it aborts. And you, you, know, you get back to the GDB prompt, and you could do the regular thing of saying backtrace and looking around at frames and inspecting variables and whatnot, but instead, in chat DBG, uh, you just say why, <laughs> all right? So that's the literal command, uh, and then you get a response, all right? And so uh, the response can be pretty amazing uh, and often is dead on. No guarantees, this is AI, all right? But uh, the, at the top it says, here's what the root cause is. The root cause is you have a zero in this multiplication and this X at the end that's not supposed to be zero is going to still be zero. Uh, it identifies where the error is uh, it explains what happened and why the error is happening, and then it proposes a fix. Um, and it explains correctly that the loop should actually start not at zero, but at one. Uh, and it explains again what the issue is, and then it tells you at the end how much this cost. So you do have to pay money, uh, and it may be hard to see, uh, but it's three cents. Okay? So not too bad. Uh, probably worth three cents. So let me explain a little bit what's going on behind the scenes, uh, because it's kind of like dark magic. Um, it really is, uh, you know, it seems like magic, but really the magic is all in the, uh, the AI. So this is actually the exact text that gets sent to the AI. Now, uh, I should tell you that we, I, my students are working on refining this and, and expanding this to be more of an actual chat to, uh, to get involved with the debugger, uh, but this is what it currently does, and it works very, very well. Uh, this took a little while to get to work the way we wanted it to. Uh, what it does is it has this, uh, this explanation, uh, you know, explain what the root cause of this error is, given this information, uh, provides the source code. Uh, we found that actually putting a little caret under the line that was responsible for the error at the stack uh, made a big difference, so it does that now. Uh, what can I tell you? Um, it looks like real error messages, I think is really what the issue is, right? The stuff that comes out of, uh, you know, that people copy and paste to Stack Overflow, and that's why it gets trained on it well. Uh, and then it explains what the local variables are, and explains what the stop reason is, all right? So what did we do? We took a debugger. Again, nobody really wanted to use a debugger, right? Like people like, use a debugger. No, no, you don't want to use a debugger. You just want your program to be correct, right? So this debugger, actually does a lot of the work for you, right? It performs some root cause analysis and proposes fixes. It exploits the niche, it's in the debugger. The debugger knows everything, right? So you can produce a stack trace on steroids, you can gather all of the relevant source code, um, you can get variable values. In dynamic languages like Python, you can find out what the dynamic type is. Um, you can uh, dereference pointers. So it actually says, oh, here's some pointers that you have on the stack, or pointers that are in scope, and it can dereference them, which is extra information that, chat, that uh, the GPT can use to, uh, to identify what the error is. Now, one thing we're not doing here uh, yet is ensuring fitness. Uh, and so what could you do? W what we foresee doing is actually patching the code, restarting it, and verifying that it doesn't cause a failure. Now, that's not quite the same thing uh, as verifying the correctness of uh, something with respect to an oracle. Uh, but it is certainly a way of showing that this did something, and then you could sign off as a developer, yes, I would like this patch to be applied. You could see this in the context of like an automatic PR. All right? Okay, so that's it for ChatDBG. On to the next tool. 
So this next tool we call CY. Uh, and so CY uh, is something that you wrap around your compiler and it explains and suggests fixes for compiler, compile time error messages. Um, I'm sure none of you in, out here have ever experienced problematic C++ compiler errors. Uh, uh, like, uh, you know, like this, for example, here's one. Uh, so here's a, a little piece of code, it was real code that we experimented with. Um, so we got this error message. Um, wait, there's more. And then there's more. Uh, I've seen way worse, right? So this is like a pretty typical example. But when you run it with CY, uh, it will tell you, hey, you're trying to use standard unordered set with standard pair as the key type, but the standard library doesn't provide a hash function for that. So here's what you need to do to fix it. And it suggests the fix, which is correct. All right? Uh, so we've been running this on a bunch of different things. Here's another example. Um, here's some very simple code uh, that it's not exactly obvious, it wasn't obvious to us. Like we, we factored this out of some real code where we had this problem. Um, this does not compile, all right? And it produces this error. No matching function call to G, uh, candidate template ignored, fantastic. So you know, I know after time you get used to these error messages and you kind of sort of build up a strategy for coping with them, but honestly, why? Uh, so that's why we have CY. So here is how you invoke CY. Uh, if you want to use it in this compiler form, you say backtick CY dash dash wrapper backtick. The default is C++. You can tell it to use Java or uh, other languages. Uh, and then it comes up with an explanation. And here it says the problem here, I love the, the wording. The problem here lies in the call to function FT inside the decal type expression. And it explains what went wrong, proposes a fix, proposes another fix, uh, and again, here it was three cents. Not too bad. All right. So uh, actually, here at this conference, uh, there was a talk on expressive compile time parsers. And one of the things so it was given by Alan Wolf. And one of the things that he showed was, uh, you know, here's some code. It's, it does have an error, which is not necessarily obvious. Uh, but when you compile it, uh, it produces this raft of errors, which are really incomprehensible because templates are involved, all right? Let's be honest, that's what's happening, all right? And uh, if you send it to CY, uh, it tells you, hey, your regular expression is invalid. It explains what went wrong. You had two dashes. Uh, it provides the corrected code, uh, and I hear, I'm sad to say it was six cents. All right, so it's very expensive to come up with this error message. Uh, I sent this to Alon, and he let me quote him here. Uh, it provided an amazing answer, way better than I expected, so. Great, all right, uh, again, you know, all right, so it was a little expensive, but fine, six cents. All right, great. Um, what's going on behind the scenes? Behind the scenes, uh, so my student Nicholas Van Kempen, is, who's currently interning at Meta, uh, he, I was like, let's do this, let's build this kind of tool. I did, just had the idea, so like it should work, uh, and he went and did it, and um, he's a, a man of few words, and he wrote, this is my code, this is my error, what's the problem? And, uh, and that's it, that basically works. So what you have to do in the tool is to go find all of the error messages, uh, find out what source lines they refer to, grab the source, assemble it into this prompt, uh, and identify the various pieces, and then assemble the prompt, and talk to OpenAI. It's really surprisingly little. Now, there's a lot of engineering that went on to make this work well, uh, but that said, at a high level, it's remarkably easy to build super powerful tools that really move the needle. And so part of what I'm talking about here is not so much just, hey, CY and ChatDBG are cool, which I do feel they are, but I want to evangelize this stuff and have you all think about what you could do to harness an AI, given that it's so simple, all right? So again, this follows the same pattern, right? So the compiler typically produces terrible error messages. We really didn't want that. We wanted to explain what went wrong and maybe even tell us how to fix it. Right, we exploit the niche, but when you're compiling something, you have access to all the source code, you know what the include files are, you have access to everything. This is actually a huge advantage, by the way, over like here's a static piece of code, what went wrong, you really need the whole environment. And of course the compiler has the whole environment, right? Uh, and ensure fitness, uh, again, this is something that we've experimented with, uh, it's not currently part of the tool, 
we can recompile, verify that the fix prevents the compiler error, and again, turn this into something in the CI uh, pipeline. All right? So um, I've talked about these three tools uh, that incorporate AI, that all do this uh, kind of evolve, exploit niche, and ensure fitness uh, approach. Um, there are some people out here who are concerned uh, about AI, uh, and it is, um, you know, it's concerning, um, but I do think that for expert software developers, uh, we should be optimistic about it, right? It really has the potential, not just for experts, but for beginners especially, uh, to really change the game and make programming a lot less painful. Uh, so to conclude, uh, let me make room for cause. Uh, I have all of these tools up here. I really strongly encourage you to go out there and spend three cents and make cool stuff happen. Uh, and thanks for your attention. Hi, um, that was a really great talk. The, I had actually seen CY before, um, and uh, that was why I came to this talk, because I thought it was a really cool tool. Um, I had not heard of ChatDBG. Um, one thing I'm wondering about, so uh, with the example of ChatDBG, I really like the idea of like walking the call stack and kind of like you know sending like the immediate source code along that. The only thing that I'm thinking about is just that like there are times where with more difficult problems, like you know, the exact line that caused the problem may not actually be in that trace that GDP gives. Um, one thing that I'm wondering about, like is it a possibility, like has there been consideration on like trying to, I mean I'm sure it's an optimization problem, like do you pay per token, is that part of the problem, like we wanna keep the window as small as possible to keep the cost down, or would it be possible to maybe, you know, for smaller projects actually send a significant portion of the code itself? Yeah, so good question. So the question is really about like, why are we sending maybe so little information? Um, so when you send information to OpenAI, uh, it, it, it counts, it, it essentially has a pricing model that's based on the number of tokens. So what's a token? A token is some sort of sub-piece of a word. Uh, there are tools out there that let you compute how many tokens there are once you send, so you can you know, make sure it fits within a window. Uh, the windows are relatively limited, but they're getting bigger. Uh, they're, the default is 4K for GPT-4, but there's now 16K. Uh, and I think these things are just gonna get larger and larger. Uh, so I'm not really super concerned about that. Um, I think the more interesting avenue really is not so much limitations on what we could send, because I don't think that that's gonna be a huge problem going forward. But uh, when the bug is somehow obscure, because the state has been so corrupted that you're in a bad place, right? So I think that there are a bunch of possibilities. Uh, roping in time travel debugging is a possibility. Um, doing something like running the program twice and collecting some information through instrumentation and then using that to put in breakpoints and watch points and turning this into a kind of an interactive chat, really, with the AI and saying, you know, what, sh what should I do next? Uh, that's something that we're currently working on. Thank, Thank you. you. Good talk, thanks. Um, can this only work with the public chat GPT or can you point this at a self-hosted instance? So there is no technical reason why you could not do this. Uh, it just uses uh, you know, the pretty standard chat completion uh, API. Uh, it doesn't currently have a facility for changing it, but uh, we'd happily accept it for Thank you. Hey, thanks, great talk. Look forward to trying it when I get home. Um, so currently with any of these tools, are you just sending um, you know, that, those tokens to you know, the, the chat bot to get the completion or are you holding or creating your own vector database locally to give it more context or is that something that you maybe see as an extension of this work in the future? Yeah, so the question is, are we, uh, yeah, are, we, are, are we doing anything like with vectors, uh, vector databases? So there's this thing of uh, vector embeddings uh, that are useful for searching repositories. We haven't found a need for it yet. Um, you know, we're certainly open to doing it, but uh, I have a kind of minimalist philosophy, like do the, the least amount that works. It's like, some people call it uh, creative laziness. Uh, some, some people, like my parents, just called it laziness. But. Um, but anyway, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, we've, we've looked into various things and we're aware of them, but we have not yet uh, used any of those techniques. 
Okay. So these tools have the potential of changing the developer in that loop significantly. And uh, I was wondering if you have any predictions what else is coming. What's coming? Uh, a tsunami um, or an asteroid. Um, so look, I think that um, you know this is absolutely, it's already changing the profession of software developers, right? Like it already has. I think just Copilot alone was already a, a big advance and things just keep it getting better. And I think that um, betting against these tools getting better and better would be a bad bet. Like, I would definitely take the opposite side of anybody who wants to bet that. Like, if there's anybody here in the crowd who's like, this is it for AI, come and see me afterwards, uh, and we'll go to an ATM. Uh, we'll make things happen. All right? Um, so, you know, that said, I mean, my current, I, and I, I think I can't possibly make predictions, right? I, no one would have predicted this. Uh, and I can't possibly predict what's going to happen in a number of years. Uh, but I do think the trend is fairly clear. And, you know, I will say right now, you know, harnessing this trend, like we use CY and ChatDBG in our lab as developers, like we use it ourselves. Uh, and it's like, oh, I don't know, you get this stream of error messages and you're like, CY, right? You know, wait half a minute, it comes up back with a result, mostly right. Uh, and it's, it just is, uh, it's like a superpower, right? So for, um, you know, let's call them the 1% developers who are represented in this room, uh, it's a superpower. It's like a bionic arm. Um, and so I think that, you know, if you're a great developer today, you'll be an astoundingly great developer in the future. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, everything looks great. Do you have some example that actually doesn't look so great or go wired, wild or go weird? So, uh, so yeah, so um, I, Let's see. So I didn't really cherry pick much. Like, uh, you know, the thing with Alon, I was like, let's see what happens. Here's a real example. Um, and if it had turned up uh, to be odd, that would have been good to say, hey, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it doesn't work, right? The, the chat DPG one in particular, uh, it's just a harder problem uh, than, uh, than CY is facing. Um, and so if you get in a situation where the stack is totally corrupted, it can't work, right? It just comes up and says, well, I, I have your source code, because it knows the source code, and it knows where it failed, and it does what it can, but it may be too late. Um, so gathering some intermediate information before then seems like a good idea. Hi, uh, kind, of, kind of related question. So what is the strategy when uh, the result is incorrect? Do you try again, or? Uh... Oh, right, that's an interesting question. Okay, so there is some randomness here. Uh, so, uh, in fact, when you go back to the well, you will get different results. Uh, so the first one, the second one, the third one may all be different. Uh, so we actually leverage this. Uh, so this is not yet released for Scalene, but we have a, a project that we call Optimator uh, that does this cycle of searching for things and generating the tests and verifying equivalents and so on. Um, and, you know, it comes up with things that are wrong. And so you literally can just try it again. We don't actually change the prompt. So this is an advantage from our perspective. Now, if you have something where you discover during research uh, or through experience, oh, here's a whole class of things that doesn't really seem to work for some reason, that's actually kind of great news for us uh, because then we're like, oh, this class is not working right. How can we solve that problem? Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody, for your attention.